yeah, I'm going to be talking about uh, regularity for local radon-like operators. Uh, and I wanted to start off with an example. So uh, the X-ray transform is an example of a local radon-like operator. And what you do, uh, at least in three dimensions, is you take a function in R3, um, and uh, you define a function uh, on the space of lines in R3 uh, by taking your function f, and then along each line, you just integrate uh, that, that function f. Uh, so the x-ray transform is on the, uh, this manifold of lines. Uh, and this uh, kind of unsurprisingly uh, has medical applications. Uh, that's why it's called the x-ray transform. It has to do with x-rays. Uh, but it's also uh, an operator that's studied in the, the field of integral geometry. Uh, and so one big question people ask is, well, okay, uh, if we know the x-ray transform uh, of a function along every line, uh, can we recover f? In other words, does the x-ray transform have an inverse? Uh, now, in two dimensions, uh, this is a very simple question, and uh, it goes by another name. It's called the radon transform. Uh, but in three dimensions, uh, this problem is actually overdetermined. Uh, and that's because the space of lines in R3 is a four-dimensional manifold. Um, so what we can do to better pose this question is take our X-ray transform and restrict it uh, to some three-dimensional family of lines, some sub-manifold. Um, so we call that a line complex, uh, and we can ask the same question. For which line complex is F, uh, can we invert uh, the restricted X-ray transform? Now, uh, this problem was studied by Gelfand and Graev in the 60s and 70s uh, in the complex case, uh, and then in the real setting by Greenleaf and Ullmann in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, and they came up with a conjecture, or not a conjecture, they, they proved something. Uh, they came up with a condition uh, that characterized which line complexes uh, uh, admitted inversions, and it's called Gelfand admissibility. Um, basically, what you do is you take any point P in the space, uh, and you look at all the lines that are in your complex uh, going through that point. Uh, that forms a cone. Uh, now, if you go along one of those lines to another point P, or sorry, another point Q, uh, and look at the cone of lines through that point, uh, Gelfand admissibility condition says that those cones must be tangent to one another along the line connecting uh, P and Q. Uh, and one example of these uh, is the uh, restricted x-ray transform pictured here. Uh, it's the uh, set of all lines which make a 45 degree angle with uh, the horizontal plane. In other words, it's the, the set of all light rays. Um, that's a Gelfand admissible line complex, and so uh, it admits an inversion. Now, the reason I'm talking about this operator in such detail is uh, a corollary of my main result uh, says that if uh, you have a restricted x-ray transform, uh, and F is Gelfand admissible, uh, such that these cones uh, through each point are curved, uh, then this restricted X-ray transform maps locally from LP to LP one minus one over P uh, for small values of P. Uh, and this uh, LP Sobolev regularity uh, is sharp. Um, now, uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna be talking about large, uh, large values of P, not small values of P. Uh, but uh, you can do that just by taking the adjoint of this operator. Uh, the adjoint of, of X and F uh, maps LP to LP1 over P for, for large values of P. Now, I said this is an example of a local radon-like operator. What are they in general? Uh, well, the thing that kind of characterizes them is you take a function in RD, you integrate it over some family of smooth surfaces, manifolds, curves, what have you, uh, and you get a function uh, that is at least locally in RD again. Um, so uh, in our case, we're just gonna be looking at radon-like operators over curves in R3. So uh, we start off with two uh, open sets and I wanna kind of be loose with um, my, my definitions here. At least I'll say they're domains, uh, omega L and omega R. Um, and then for each X and omega L, I uh, associate a curve mx in omega r, um, which uh, th this family of curves will depend smoothly on x. Uh, then a local radon-like operator associated to this family of curves is defined by just taking your function f, hitting it with some smooth bump function uh, so that everything is local, uh, and then integrating that uh, along the curve mx for each x. 
so we see the family of curves uh, for the restricted X-ray transform from before uh, is just your the the curves in your or the lines in your line complex. Uh, so that's a local radon like operator. Um, but we can be a little bit more specific uh, by what we mean by depending smoothly on X. Um, doing a little bit of work, we can assume that these MX are actually sections of a manifold M living inside the product space of these domains. Uh, and further, by some change of variables, we can assume uh, locally at least that this M is the zero set of a smooth vector valued function phi, um, such that the uh, gradients of phi in X and in Y uh, both have full rank as matrices. Um, so we have this uh, manifold M, which is the zero set of our function phi, uh, and then using some Fourier inversion, uh, we can actually get uh, an oscillatory integral representation of this radon-like operator. So uh, the integral in Y and in tau of E to the I, uh, the inner product of tau with this uh, defining function phi. Um, so now that we know something about uh, what a local radon-like operator is, and we have one example, uh, I wanna talk about what we mean by measuring the LP Sobolev norms. Uh, so LP Sobolev regularity. Uh, so because these operators are defined locally, um, we can't use global LP Sobolev norms uh, unless we say something about the regularity of the boundary that, that starts to come into play. Uh, but since I want to kind of keep these uh, omega r and omega l arbitrary, uh, I just hit everything with smooth cutoffs. Uh, and then my norm depend or my estimates depend on uh, these smooth cutoffs, but like that's fine. Everything is local anyway. Um, so what are some basic facts about these operators? Uh, so first off, unlike in the case of singular radon transforms, uh, because there's no Calderon Zygmunt kernel, uh, these operators are bounded on LP. Uh, always, uh, for, for at least locally, um, for all values of P. And there's an approximation of the identity argument involving uh, this uh, oscillatory integral representation uh, in order to prove that. Um, the other thing that we uh, know uh, is that there's a, a wealth of history uh, on L2 Sobolev regularity for these operators, uh, because local radon-like operators uh, are examples of Fourier integral operators. And so there's this whole theory uh, going back to Hormander and even before that, uh, relating L2 Sobolev uh, regularity to the geometry of the wavefront set of the Schwartz kernel of R. Uh, in other words, the, the canonical relation uh, associated to R. Um, so uh, if you don't know what that is, that's okay. Um, we don't need to go too much into it for this talk. Uh, but basically you have this, uh, almost phase space transformation sort of uh, between uh, the phase space of your input uh, and the phase space of your output. Uh, and the geometry of the, this wave front set uh, is really uh, what matters are these projections, um, pi r and pi l, uh, to see kind of how this canonical relation, uh, or how the canonical relation sits inside uh, of these two cotangent bundles. Uh, now, since we know something, you know, a little more explicitly, we have a formula uh, for our uh, local radon-like operator, we can describe uh, what this canonical relation is. Um, it turns out it's the twisted conormal bundle uh, of our manifold M from before. Uh, and by twisted, I just mean I've swapped some of the order of the coordinates and I've made this last term negative. Um, and that's just for purposes of, of composition calculi from, from the theory of FIOs. Uh, so it has this nice uh, explicit formulation uh, in terms of just the derivatives of phi uh, restricted to uh, your set M. Uh, and the natural projections, pi L and pi R, uh, are respectively just the projections to these first two components uh, for pi L and these last two components for pi R. So now that we've talked a little bit about the canonical relation, um, what does the theory of FIOs say about uh, L2 regularity for these? So uh, the best case uh, occurs when uh, pi L and pi R are both local diffeomorphisms. Uh, this goes back to the work of Hormander. Um, in the realm of like radon transforms and radon like operators, this goes by another name. It's known as non-vanishing rotational curvature. Um, that terminology is due to Fong and Stein. Uh, in both cases, uh, in our case, or in our situation, uh, the 
uh, non-vanishing rotational curvature means that this determinant uh, is non-vanishing for all non-zero choices of tau. Uh, now, if this were true, uh, if the rotational curvature is non-vanishing, uh, then R would gain half a derivative on L2. And by interpolation with our LP bounds, uh, we get uh, one over P derivative gain uh, for P greater than two and one minus one over P derivative gain for, for P between one and two. Um, and there are examples that show that this cannot be improved uh, beyond. So every uh, LP Sobolev regularity result uh, has to lie inside of this triangle. Um, but unfortunately, this best case scenario is actually impossible uh, to achieve for local radon-like operators um, uh, over curves in, all, in R3. And in fact, there's like a really uh, specific relationship that has to exist between the dimension of your manifolds and the dimension of your ambient space in order to even have examples. Uh, so we can't rely on this uh, best case L2 result. Um, uh, to, to get us up to these optimal lines. So the question is then how do we actually achieve uh, uh, LP regularity uh, uh, that attains these lines? Um, and I do wanna point out that this um, one minus one over P derivative gain uh, for small values of P is exactly what I quoted in my corollary uh, for the restricted X-ray transform. So uh, the, the strategy for uh, trying to prove results for local radon-like operators, uh, much like most of mathematics, uh, is you start with model cases. Um, and you then see if you can extrapolate from those and see the general structure within those cases. So uh, the case that we're going to look at uh, is uh, one uh, studied by Pramonik and Seeger uh, back in 2007. So uh, let's start with a smooth regular curve in R3 uh, and let chi be a smooth bump function. Uh, using those two, we can construct a measure mu, uh, which is supported on gamma, uh, and we can then construct a convolution operator, T f of x, which is just the convolution of f with that measure mu. Uh, and if we write out the integral representation of this, uh, we get uh, this formula here, which uh, from here you can see pretty clearly this is a, a local radon-like operator where our uh, curves that we're integrating over are just translates of the curve gamma. Now what Pramonic and Seeger were able to show is that if gamma has non-vanishing curvature and torsion, then T uh, has this optimal LP regularity provided P is greater than four. Uh, and it turns out that's sharp uh, except for uh, the endpoint possibly that's still open. Um, and the proof uh, relied on uh, the fact that this was a convolution operator. So if you're looking at the L2 regularity of a convolution operator, uh, you want to try to show uh, Fourier decay of the convolution kernel, in this case, the Fourier transform of your measure. Um, now, if we take the Fourier transform of this measure, you get a very nice uh, oscillatory integral um, that is uh, just the inner product of C with uh, your curve gamma. Now, we're assuming that, that gamma has non-vanishing curvature and torsion. And what that means is that uh, the first three derivatives of gamma are uh, linearly independent. Therefore, at least one of the first three derivatives of this phase function is bounded away from zero. Um, and so by a combination of van der Kolpitz lemma or a uh, non-stationary phase argument, uh, you can show that this uh, uh, this measure has uniform Fourier decay of C to the negative one third. Uh, but that's just a uniform bound. You have a, a set of bad directions where that's actually attained, but most everywhere else you actually have better. Um, and the set where that, uh, that worst decay occurs uh, is the set where the first two derivatives of this phase function are zero. In other words, the set of C, which are orthogonal to the first two derivatives of gamma, uh, and put another way, uh, the set of C, which are orthogonal to the tangent vector and the normal vector uh, to your curve gamma. So uh, these are termed the binormal vectors to gamma, um, just from the like Frenet frame. Uh, and they uh, form a curved cone, a cone with one uh, non-vanishing principal curvature. Uh, that is again, uh, a basic geometry fact coming from the, the fact that gamma has non-vanishing curvature and torsion. Um, so we've got this like cone of bad directions, uh, but away from that, we get better Fourier decay. 
And so the, the basic idea of their proof is you do a dyadic decomposition away from this bad uh, set of bad directions. And on those uh, dyadic pieces, you get improved Fourier decay first off. And second off, uh, those pieces uh, are neighborhoods themselves of curved cones. Uh, and so we can apply uh, brigand demeter decoupling. Uh, now in Pramonic and Seeger's case, this was before 2015. So uh, they used uh, an early version of decoupling that was due to Wolf uh, from 2000. Uh, but this is sort of the, the key idea that we want to try to generalize uh, to uh, find optimal LP regularity uh, for local VATON operators. And so the question is, you know, how do we reinterpret this uh, proof structure in terms of the canonical relation and all of this uh, general stuff? Uh, and the key here is in red, that this set of bad directions in the case of uh, this operator T uh, is the, the fibers of the image of the singularities of uh, the maps uh, pi L and pi R. Um, and there's a couple of additional things that need to be true in order to apply this same like proof structure. Uh, so first off, we need that as we get away from B, uh, our Fourier decay increases. In other words, uh, in, in terms of a general local rat on operator, uh, you need uh, improved L2 regularity on these, these pieces that are decomposed away from the set of singularities of pi L. Uh, and the other thing that we need uh, is this, these fibers to form curved cones so that we can try to apply decoupling. Uh, and there's one additional wrinkle that I didn't mention uh, on the slide, uh, which is that because this is a convolution kernel, uh, it's translation invariant, which means the fibers of these singularities uh, are actually all the same. Whereas in general, for a, a generic local rat on like operator, these fibers are gonna be shifting with X. Uh, and so you won't get everything sitting on top of each other nicely, uh, which makes things harder. So um, the other thing uh, that, well, uh, what we're looking for is uh, trying to figure out what assumptions we can put on a local rat on like operator uh, so that these uh, key ideas can be uh, extrapolated. Um, uh, and one of the uh, conditions that seems necessary uh, is that uh, the maps pi L and pi R, at least one of them, uh, should have fold singularities. Um, so uh, we know that they can't be diffeomorphisms, they have to have some singularities, but uh, kind of fold singularities are the best <laughs> kind of singularities that you can hope for. Uh, and it's true that this operator T, uh, both pi L and pi R have fold singularities. So what is a fold singularity? Well, uh, a smooth map has a fold singularity. If first off, the rank of the differential of that map drops by as little as possible, it has to drop by at least one. Uh, so the co-rank is one. Uh, Second, the uh, determinant of the differential uh, should vanish only to order one. Um, and third, in particular, uh, the determinant of the differential vanishes to order one in the direction of the kernel of the differential. Now, uh, the first two of these conditions uh, imply by the implicit function theorem that the set L of singularities of this map is locally a hypersurface. Um, and the third condition implies that the uh, kernel of this map is transverse to that hypersurface. Um, and so just uh, to get us back to this picture, we've got pi L and pi R. Uh, and if we assume, say, that pi L has fold singularities, then uh, <clears throat> that implies that this uh, set of singularities L forms a hypersurface in the conormal bundle, or in the conormal, yeah, in the conormal bundle. Uh, but that doesn't say much about what happens uh, down in the cotangent bundle. And I'm realizing this should have been the cotangent bundle of omega L and cotangent bundle of, of omega R, uh, my mistake. So we need an additional assumption to, to say that uh, when we take these singularities and we project them down, uh, that the fibers of those things are first off uh, a hypersurface and second off have a uh, uh, curvature such that we get a cone. Um, and 
that second uh, assumption, that additional assumption we need, is uh, presented in this conjecture by Pramonic and Seeger. Um, so it's specifically um, that uh, if we take this projection from the conormal bundle uh, of M down to M and restrict that map to our set of singularities, uh, the resulting map there is a submersion. Uh, and what Pramonic and Seeger were able to prove is that uh, if this map is a submersion, then the fibers are indeed curved cones for each X. Uh, and in fact, uh, what's conjectured is that you, you don't need both pi L and pi R to be folds. Uh, you should be able to get away with just one of those maps having fold singularities. Uh, and uh, the conjecture, just to finish stating it, is uh, if those two things are true, uh, then you get this optimal one over P derivative gain uh, for P greater than four. Now, this is a conjecture, but where has it been proven? Uh, so it, in order to prove this, so far we've needed to make additional assumptions on the singularities of pi r as well. Uh, so Pramonic and Seeger uh, extrapolating from this model case of the convolution operator with curves, uh, we're able to show this conjecture holds true if pi r also has folds. Um, and my work has been to show uh, the opposite side of things. Uh, so uh, if pi r has what's called a blowdown, uh, then I was able to show uh, that this conjecture also holds true. Um, now, uh, a blowdown is, I'm not going to go into details of what it is, but it's sort of the, the like worst case that can happen if one of your uh, maps uh, has uh, fold singularities. Um, and so there's sort of this open question of what happens in between, and the hope is to, to go through piece by piece uh, and um, prove uh, for finite type uh, singularities, and then finally uh, get, get this whole conjecture proven. Uh, but I think I'm two minutes over. So I'm going to finish with the statement of my theorem and say thanks for uh, having me. Thank you, Jeff.